Why? Hello and welcome everybody. So today I wanted to go ahead and update you guys with another video of my Mono Righteous Fire character. I'll probably be stopping it after this video just because the upgrades are kind of getting a bit extreme and I think I'd rather maybe play the build in a different way but there's still so much to figure out. So anyway with that being said let me go ahead and jump into a quick map and kind of show you guys what it looks like. So uh, I don't have any footage of some content here but I did also attempt a few Ubers on my character. I tried doing Uber Eater and that did not work out very well, primarily because I am using Scorching Ray, which makes me stand still. Uh, Uber Eater was like really difficult because he would blink around a lot and I could not really deal with the tentacles very well. However, on the flip side, I decided to tackle Uber Shaper and you can face tank every mechanic in there. You can face tank the beam, you can face tank the slam, you can face tank the balls, so that worked out a lot better. So kind of what I have turned this guy into is more of a high budget Righteous Fire mapping build. Um, it kind of works like Explode Righteous Fire, right? If you pay attention to my flask gear, I've got an Oriath's End that's essentially being permanently automated. This synergizes really well with the Hierophant node for essentially 100% AoE. Um, so that's kind of what I've made this character. It, it just feels like a, a pretty solid mapper. It's just pretty expensive. Oh, uh, don't mind me boys, I forgot to go on D&D. Yikers. Minus 400c. So this character, unfortunately, is uh, not cheap. I would say, based off of Trade League prices, my character is close to around 100 Divines. Although I did not put more than maybe 30-something Divines in myself. And of those 30 Divines, I would say a third of them went into my Watcher's Eye. Uh, my Watcher's Eye is currently a double conversion with Clarity Bonus Mana as ES. You don't need anything that crazy. Um, the main reason for the double conversion is I am not running Determination anymore. Instead of running Determination, I've opted out to run Purity of Elements. This makes the build feel a lot better in a mapping environment, personally, and allows me to sacrifice a little bit of extra res that I would normally have on my Flask number 2 in favor of an Oriath's End. Uh, and this kind of like really helps a lot with the clear. I mean, it pretty much clears like Delirium content like butter, right? I will say though, the League Mechanic itself, when I'm stacking the League Mechanic in the maps that I'm running now, so that's like my Wandering Path, Delirium, plus the League Mechanic, and Ultra Mods, things can get kind of out of hand. I mean, we're talking about giving monsters like 400% bonus elemental damage, huge sources of critical strike, you know, Giga Chad Turbo. <laughs> so in scenarios like that, this build does feel a little bit squishy. But, you know, for standard mapping, nothing crazy, it is not too bad at all. I could even see myself doing much, much, much higher delirium, right? That's not really a problem. I have no idea where the DPS of the build lies. I want to say it feels like it's around 15 million when I'm ramped up. The problem, again, with the whole ramp mechanic is if I'm unable to face tank the target, I cannot properly ramp my damage. So, when I'm referring to ramping, I'm referring to Indigon. So, Indigon over here basically gives you spell damage as you spend mana. So if we look at our RF right now, it's 1.2 million. But say I do something like this right now where I'm dumping my MP pool, it's now 6.8 million. Oh, hey, look, a new peak for us. I should update the tooltip. So things like that kind of allow the Indigon, well, basically your Righteous Fire damage to just go crazy. But if you're unable to face tank the target or you're doing bosses where they're blinking around, you know, Awaken or things like that, the damage uptime really just kind of starts to plummet. And I'm really curious to see other variants of this. So now that I've pretty much finished the map, I just wanted to go ahead and talk about my character, the decision behind everything, you know, kind of, I guess, more so like a guide. First off, I do want to state that I could min-max this build a little bit more. Um, so if you look at my tree right now, you'll notice there's like this weird line here. This line is because of a jewel called Split Personality located right here. So this is a very expensive jewel. Um, right now, it's probably running close to like... I want to say close to probably like eight divines for this jewel itself but the thing about split personality is it would it would kind of make me want to redo my tree if i were to use two of these so i could get myself to about eighteen thousand energy shield and close to fifteen thousand mana if i went ahead and redid the tree for that so it kind of come like up here right and then you would swing down here and then you would work your way through here and go up there a bit complicated right Anyway, like I said, we're getting to the point where I'm pretty happy and pretty satisfied with the character. I don't know if I really want to just keep dumping currency into it. So overall, pretty happy with the character, like I said. I don't really like how squishy it feels. I mean, I have a massive energy shield pool, but my character feels paper thin. I think if I were to take another go at this, 
I would maybe try to do something with like Aegis Aurora, uh, Melding of the Flesh. Maybe get like 85 all res with block cap and spell block cap with armor. And the problem though is like scaling armor is a little tricky. Um, I do also think there's another variant. I think uh, one mana left plays it where you basically you strength stack and you in stack. The benefit of strength stacking and in stacking is you get to use gloves called Shaper's Touch. Now Shaper's Touch essentially give you mana based off of your strength. A little bit, not like a crazy amount, right? Is it one mana per four strength? More importantly, though, it gives you um, the where is it on here? Two percent evasion rating per ten intelligence. The reasoning that is good is you can opt in to run grace. So for the content where you know there's like a bunch of soul eaters that are surrounding you, your grace will really add a nice comfy defensive layer to the build. I personally didn't care for it because what I noticed I was dying to are the. Uh, the miscreants that spawn in the eater mo like altars you know the ones that like hit you really really quickly and without like bl a block recovery setup or spell suppression i'm kind of just going to get deleted by those so i opted out for an explode setup where basically i just blink in everything's face and it kind of just insta dies and it does not really matter you know when your rf is hitting such high levels of damage you kind of pivot into the i could try to tank it but i could just get more damage in aoe and kill it and honestly that's worked out well i mean i haven't really died much at all since I stopped doing the league mechanics, so I could easily see myself pushing this character to 100, no problem. So let's talk about the build, and I, I've talked about this a lot in like previous videos, but I wanna go ahead and just explain a little bit more kind of on the character. So there's a couple of mechanics that kind of go together. So Chevron's Revelation is a fantastic budget ring for this build. If I take it off here, you'll notice I go down literally 2000 MP, but now I gain a buffer of mono regen. The thing about the buffer of mono regen, it works really nice, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with it, I think it's a fantastic option, but Shav's Revelation is really nice because not only does it massively skyrocket our ES regen, which you can see right there, but that extra 2000 MP means that we're dumping our mana with Indigon quicker and quicker and quicker. The more mana you have, the more mana you can dump, the quicker you can ramp. Remember when you're bossing, you don't just get to stand there for free all the time. So Shav's Revelation is such a fantastic pickup um, for this build. The other thing about the whole strength stacking I was talking about is I decided to not go for like a strength stack variant and I wanted to go primarily for int. And then I realized like even int stacking is just, it becomes really expensive after a certain point. So I kind of just like stopped. Um, by not having to go for strength on all of my suffixes, I can easily get things with chaos res. So you'll notice these boots, for example, have like 26 chaos res. These gloves, for example, have 21 chaos res, right? My ring, I opted out for a chaos res base. My amulet has chaos res. I kind of did this so I could also do the league mechanic quite a bit because running with like negative 60 chaos res in the league mechanic, you guys are aware. I mean, you just get popped and deleted from nowhere. So overall, still pretty happy with the character. Um, to talk about like a few mechanics that kind of go together. The reasoning we use Ivory Tower in this build is Ivory Tower is just a fantastic chess piece for the amount of energy shield it gives. So first off, it gives 70 intelligence, which is a great role for Int. Remember, Int gives percent ES. Int also gives base mana, so very good together. It gives a sick mana roll. It gives 2.2% ES regen, which is one of the harder stats to come by in this build. It is a little tricky to sustain the Righteous Fire. And then the Chaos Damage is taken from mana before life. The Chaos Damage taken from mana before life will allow you to potentially not run a Coruscating Elixir. I opted for the Coruscating Elixir route because it's the easiest to set up and the smoothest. I don't really have to worry about anything. I just tap the flask and I'm good to go, right? <laughs> the other thing is when you reserve your health, which you want to in this build, it kind of puts the Ivory Tower close to like a 700 ES chess piece that also has ES regen, that also has a mana roll, that also has an int roll. So it's just a good chess piece, right? Not mandatory, but fantastic for that choice. Your scepter, your scepter, you want something with like probably double dot multi int. The reason I have cast speed is to make the build feel better because I'm using Scorching Ray and like flammability, for example. And then for your prefixes, you probably want like mana, hybrid spell damage with mana, and then probably like spell damage or fire damage. Um, your Indigon, the purpose of the Indigon, remember, is to ramp. So like we're sitting at 600k right now, and if I do this, then I go to 2 million. So Indigon's ramping is pretty much makes the entire build. I will say this is part of what I kind of don't like about it. It just feels like I'm building the character around a gimmick and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's not what I'm used to, right? Usually with Righteous Fire, my damage uptime is always, there is no like ramping period. So it feels really weird to play 
a ramping damage over time build that's not poison. It's just kind of strange, right? It works really well for mapping. It's, again, the single target that's kind of a bit annoying. So the reasoning for Prism Guardian in this build, Prism Guardian gets really easy access to either A, two 50% auras and a 35, or B, two 35s and a 50. So what that means is Discipline is a 35, Purity of Fire is a 35, and Purity of Elements is a 50. So you can easily fit this on your life pool. Um, and then remember, by reserving your life pool, you are gaining energy shield because of your ivory tower, right? So you can see the energy shield kind of surging up when I activate these auras, right? Again, I would totally recommend running Grace in a setup like this. It's just because of the content I was doing, I did not really feel it was necessary, so I didn't really go for it. Um, this left ring over here, I opted out for a dot multi ring. Remember with Indigon, we have loads of percent increase because of spell damage. So we really want damage over time multiplier. So this is just an in damage over time multiplier and that's it. The mana region here actually doesn't even do anything. Over here on my boots, I just kind of went with resistance boots. Um, the build does get really, really resistance starved. And since I opted for an Oriath's end, I'm losing an extra suffix on resistance. To explain what I am referring to, if I come over here to my tab and you look at this bismuth, um, this bismuth where you see it has uh, essentially like the reduced charges used with regen, instead of having a regen there, I could have uh, 40 all res. So 40 all res would free up so much, but then I lose explode on Oriaths and I wanted this character to be more clear, so I went with Oriaths. For a budget option, you can still use the bismuth setup and then just use Legacy of Fury. Legacy still adds a ton of clear. I just want it to be more tanky. And if you notice on the rare boots, you can roll things like maximum fire resistance and regen per endurance charge. So that, again, helps with the void of having really shitty sustain. Uh, for my belt, I accidentally crafted a 20 divine belt. Now, my belt doesn't actually do really that much for my build. Um, it, it does in the sense of it has like the sick intel with the L attributes, right? But I accidentally rolled a strength roll, which was super lucky. And that strength roll massively inflates the price of this piece of gear uh, because people do strength in stack, right? But again, I'm not moving to the strength in stack. I think that's way more expensive. So I was kind of just happy with this. As for my Abyssal Socket, it was pretty much just like a shit ton of mana and intelligence, right? On, on this one right here. Uh, gloves. Now, another problem with Shaper's Touch that I don't really like is you lose your fire exposure on hit. So when I'm mapping, you'll notice that I spam my Frost Blink. My Frost Blink has Archmage on it, so it's dumping a lot of my mana. And remember, when we dump mana, we are triggering Indigon's um, spell damage multiplier. But the Frost Blink also gets the 100% natural AoE from Hierophant because we don't reserve our mana, which means that I'm applying fire exposure in like a massive AoE around me. The only other way I could see myself getting around that is changing the large cluster jewel here. So instead of it giving 20% mana, uh, you would run a large fire cluster and get Master of Fire here, which is nearby enemies have minus fire resist. It basically applies fire exposure in an AoE. The downside is you would lose mana. The upside is you would gain these little nodes back and they would be fire damage. But remember, increases are not as good with Indigon because Indigon is ramping up your increases. Okay, um, other than that, I think that pretty much covers most of the gear. Again, you can see I opted out here for like Chaos Resistance on my gloves. So I want to go ahead and talk about the links and kind of why I decided to use what I did. So here I've got Eternal Blessing, Arcane Cloak, Malevolence. Um, Malevolence essentially is a massive damage over time multiplier and also gives us skill effect duration, which is pretty quality of life. I know some people like to run um, like reduced duration, Swift Affliction on Arcane Cloak to just kind of have it ramp quickly. I personally didn't really feel it was necessary. I liked the massive buffer while I was mapping. Um, speaking of Arcane Cloak, if you are running Chavron's Revelation, sometimes what happens is you'll get to this weird spot where you have no mana and you can't do anything because you don't regen. To alleviate this, I actually opted out to put one point into recover 10% mana over one second when you use a guard skill. The reasoning that this is significant is when you have zero mana regen because of Shav's Revelation, sometimes you'll get into a weird scenario where you'll frost blink and use 99% of your mana and now you can't shield charge because Indigon's second line says increase cost of skills for each 200 mana spent recently. So now your shield charge takes like 60 MP and you don't have any. Thankfully, Arcane Cloak doesn't cost any mana. And if you look at my mana pool at 2100, you'll notice it will consume some, but instantly recover. 
So that right there on left click kind of fits like that weird gap that sometimes has or happens. So I was very happy uh, for this setup here. I personally tried damage recoup and it just didn't really feel very good. Maybe if you can stack a whole bunch of recoup, it would feel better. I, I really like this 10% mono over one second. It was it was pretty quality of life. Okay, um, so that's that setup pretty much right there. Over here in the Indigon, I've got Armageddon brand of Voltality, um, Scorching Gray, Awakened Castwall Channeling, and Infused Channeling. Now, shout out to uh, One Mono Left, I believe is his name. He's the one who I believe discovered the setup where basically you take the recover 10% of mana when a brand expires while attached. So there's two that you can swap between. Penance brand of Conduction instead of Armageddon brand will get you full mana like instantly when you are mapping. But the um, <clears throat> the Armageddon brand of Vitality I find is the best for getting your mana back on single target. So like boss encounters. So essentially when the brand expires, right? Um, you recover 10% and uh, it pretty much pops instantly. So you'll just have to try it out and see. I, I don't really know how to explain the brand mechanics very well. I can just tell you that this gets you about two times the MP back as this, but this in a mapping scenario gets you full MP, but you usually don't need it because your clear is fantastic, right? Over in the Prism Guardian, I've got Discipline, Purity of Fire, and Purity of Elements. Again, the Purity of Elements is quality of life for me, so I can run Ori Sen. That's the primary reason. Um, in my boots, I've got Shield Charge, Faster Attacks, Frost Blink, Archmage. Um, this is my preferred movement style in softcore. I love being able to do this. It's just kind of what makes the game enjoyable for me. You can all uh, opt out for a different mobility set if you want. The reasoning for Archmage on Frost Blink is to dump mana. Um, you can also Frost Blink while you're channeling. So it, to me, it's a really nice way to dump mana. And when you're mapping, it's a perfect way to dump mana. If you remove Archmage, it just doesn't feel as good for me, and then I kind of don't have a good way to dump the MP. So over in the gloves, I've got Flammability, Clarity, Hex Bloom, and Arrogance. So the Arrogance just goes for the Clarity, and the primary reasoning is for the Watcher's Eye I have, which is located right over... Where is my Watcher's Eye? There's too many things in this build. Here we go. So the, the clarity here, if you look at my energy shield, right, you can see it's giving me about 2,000 for this gain 8% of maximum mana. I also have 17% conversion on this Watcher's Eye along with conversion on my Prism Guardian. Those three conversion rolls, I decided to opt out to drop determination for Purity of Elements. Um, and I, I feel quite fine like that. Like I said, I was tanking Uber Shaper Slams, but it's not the tankiest build when mapping. It just helps me against like the bigger hits. Uh, but again, with Frost Blink, I can pretty much just like switch to anywhere I want. So if I'm getting locked in place, you just Frost Blink on top of a target and it dies. So that's what I kind of decided to go with. All right. And then the last links are on the RF itself. So Arcane Surge. Remember, Arcane Surge works like Life Tap here. So if I take Arcane Surge out, you'll notice the green link goes away. So Arcane Surge gives us a spell multi and allows us to use Swift Affliction. So I've got Arcane Surge... Control Destruction, Righteous Fire, Awaken Swift Affliction, Awaken Deadly Focus, and Awaken Burn Damage. Uh, the Awaken Gems are not really big priority. They kind of just like add a little bit of AoE if you can hit a breakpoint, which I'm not currently on RF. Every four levels, it gets like a little bit of a meter bonus. Um, I was just pretty much gearing up the characters, so that's kind of why we went with that. Yep. Other than that, let's go ahead and talk about the skill tree pathing and the jewels. So... I believe for leveling, I quite literally followed the same tree. I think I may have started like through the Ellie damage here, right? And went through life, maybe grabbed some AoE. Uh, and then I pretty much rushed over here to get Trader. You do not need this, but Trader makes the build level. Trader makes any build feel great because you have like almost permanent Quicksilver during the campaign. More importantly, Trader makes it so if you have a Ruby Flask, the Ruby Flask is pretty much automated permanently. And this is very, very strong because the build lacks sustain. So getting any extra regeneration will make the build feel much better. This is why I opted out for Trader to make it very smooth to play, right? Anyway, though, coming down here, I have a random Abyssal Jewel here to help overcap me for maps. Um, you can see like pretty much the Mana Mastery all over here. Your primary goal is picking up Mana. Originally, when I leveled, you know, you're going to grab all of your adjacent life nodes. Um, there's no reason not to, right? Swing up, grab all of your mana nodes. Now, you don't have to do this in the exact order. I'm just explaining kind of what I have done now. Pain Attunement is a massive damage over time multiplier because we are always at low life. Remember, the low life is circumvented. Uh, Chaos Damage hits the mana pool with Ivory Tower before it hits the life pool. And with Coruscating Elixir being permanent, 
um, it has to hit the energy shield pool first, so that part doesn't even really matter. Uh, coming up here, the pathing looks a little bit weird because it's designed for split personality. Some more mana nodes on the side here. Remember, uh, a much stronger split personality setup is kind of pathing across through here and then swinging down here, dropping this connector, coming down through here, through over here, and then swinging up, switching the brand mastery from here to the brand mastery here. And then you can either choose to keep the energy shield or just drop it. You probably honestly don't really need it. You can switch this mastery over here anyway. Don't really worry about that. Okay, uh, going into some more important things. I opted out to put the healthy mind located right here because it's less points than putting it here. I'm not sure which one is better. It might very well be this one, but this gives more MP because the healthy mind here gives 16% mana. And then you have a 12%, a 20%, and then a 12%. So very big for MP scaling. Now, coming on over towards here, you've got some important masteries. So the 2% region I was talking about, along with the less damage taken from over time, very, very important. And then up here, um, I decided to go into a cluster jewel. Nothing expensive. The primary goal is to just push a uh, scintillating idea to the front. Um, this gives 20% maximum mana. There's another one that's way more expensive, which is Arcane Surge Effect but it doesn't have any mana. That one was like five divines and this was like 40 chaos. So I just went with this one. This is where you can see the split personality kind of kicks in. So you can see the split personality is giving like 58 intelligence and 58 mana, which is a direct boost to the, you know, your damage and your survivability. Up here, I have the watcher's eye I talked about. If you want to look for budget watcher's eye, anything with mana gained as energy shield with nothing else or just any form of conversion. There's even like if you're running determination, you can do crit damage reduction is a big one. When you have a really big energy shield pool and not much mitigation, I think critical strike damage reduction is fantastic. Over here, Zealot's Oath is kind of mandatory for the build. Without Zealot's Oath, all of your form of regeneration does not really apply because you primarily stack life regen and then convert it to energy shield, right? Coming down over here, uh, depending on your aura reservation, you may or may not need to grab the life reservation efficiency over here. So because I am running the double 35, I don't need it. Um, another potential option, this is going to sound a little complicated, is to save some points. If you are running a 50, 50, 35, I'm running a 35, 35, 50. You can go ahead and anoint um, champion of the cause because it gives reservation efficiency and not mono reservation efficiency. And then I believe all you need to do is get a corrupted jewel with 2% reservation efficiency and slap it here or wherever you really want to. And that should allow you to get your auras without having to spend um, the four points here. Cause normally you would have to spend the three here, which don't really do anything for you aside from a little bit of aura effect. And then you take, um, uh, what is it right here? 20% uh, life reservation efficiency of skills. Coming down over here, we have arcane surge scaling. Arcane Surge is a massive multiplier for this build. It's one of the primary reasons we are playing Hierophant because Arcane Surge is essentially a spell damage multiplier. And if you know anything about PoE, multipliers are king, especially when you have something like Indigon giving you ridiculous amounts of increased spell damage, right? Okay, so that pretty much covers the tree and kind of where I progressed and kind of what I did. Uh, one of the few things I did not talk about is another expensive interaction located right here. This is Impossible Escape which allocates unwavering stance. Now, fortunately, I bought this when it was about like 1.5 divine. I think it's like 10 now. The purpose of this is more sustain. So this is hitting right here to get Brink of Death, which you can also anoint. Brink of Death anoint is 4% regen. Um, you've got Prismatic Skin and then the maximum fire res over here. If you are struggling with regeneration, consider getting this 3% regen per, uh, per second, putting it on your uh, Bismuth Flask so you can have that permanently automated. Furthermore, don't forget to defense catalyst your Chevron's revelation, because if you look, it says right ring slot regenerate 6% of energy shield per second with catalyst that goes up to 7.2%. So that's another 1.2. Remember, you want a 21 purity of fire because it gets a breakpoint. So this 21 is currently four max res. If we slap it in here, it goes to 23, which is five max fire res. So another thing to talk about would be my charms. So I'm currently running kind of like uh, maximum mana gained as energy shield with minus exposure charms. So if you want more sustain, there is maximum fire resistance charms. There's also uh, energy shield regeneration charms. Furthermore, the league mechanic has that unique jewel. That unique jewel can be incredibly strong for sustain. 
You could replace this rare jewel I have, for example. The unique jewel can also roll maximum fire resistance, energy shield regeneration, mana gained as extra energy shield. So a lot of those cool sources you can kind of stack to make the build a bit stronger. You can go ahead and try to aim for two max fire resistance on your boots instead of one max fire resist. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Anyway, I think that's actually like pretty much legitimately about it. I think I've pretty much explained everything. The only other thing to really talk about, it's very minor, is uh, over here you'll notice I have a Sigil of Power. If I'm doing bossing content, I just replace Hexbloom because Hexbloom doesn't do anything when you're bossing. It just makes your curse proliferate. So we just put Hexbloom and swap it with Sigil. And then the Sigil of Power, basically, whenever we are uh, ramping our mana costs, the Sigil will activate, giving us big damage reduction uh, while we are inside it. Um, so that's another nice option. Another thing you can do, which I was testing out, is instead of running Malevolence, you can decide to run Zealotry. Zealotry will be a bit less damage, but what Zealotry will provide is the ability to generate Consecrated Ground during boss fights, because your Armageddon brand will hit multiple times. Um, the Cyclone variant will work better for this, but with Cyclone, you kind of need Shaper's Touch, because we don't really have any accuracy. If you're using Shaper's Touch, you'll notice that there is a line here that says 4 accuracy per 2 int, so that would give essentially close to accuracy caps, so you would permanently have your consecrated ground up. Um, so that's another option, right? A lot of th this is what I mean by it gets a little bit weird. It's not like I'm just scaling my righteous fire and my fire trap and throwing in some other mechanics. There's like a lot kind of going in into this build, and it can feel a little bit weird and clunky at times. That's why I like it as a mapper because when you're mapping, it doesn't feel clunky. You're just shield charge, frost blink, shield charge, frost blink, shield charge, frost blink, right? You're not really like playing this weird mini game in between. Anyway, though, I think that's pretty much about it. Like I said, I would like to explore this character another time, but I don't want to just keep putting in 10 divine upgrades into the build. It just feels weird to me, right? Um, I'm not really sure what's going to come next, but I would like to see other variants of this build. I'm very excited to see what like Lance puts out and one mana left, you know, seeing if they can make like a good spin off. They're definitely way more uh, educated when it comes to attribute stacking and specifically mana stacking you know i'm mainly the life righteous fire guy so very curious to see what people put together uh, anyway that's pretty much about it so i hope you guys enjoyed the video if you did please feel free to like share and subscribe and don't forget you can catch me streaming live every day but sundays at twitch.tv slash pox see you guys all tomorrow and uh hope to see you guys all in ray class